and I jumped out of the way. I said, oh, my God, this plane's going to crash. This thing came right across north to south. Of Incidentally, I was a private pilot, so I have some familiarity with the airspace. It glided over my house, and there was absolutely we saw a, no noise. What I thought to be a kind of a boomerang shape. I thought, my God, that's a wingspan. I've never seen anything like that. They were reported by at least one commercial airline pilot. It was, it was humongous, that's all I can say. It passed right in front of us, uh, just about uh, right above eye's length. No, I don't hear anything. What in the hell is that? It's, it's wide. I came out second after Monica, and I remember looking at it. It was coming over the mountain, and it was like yes. almost as wide as one of the humps. And it yes. was very exactly. low. It's coming across the sky, and as it's moving, it's blocking and unblocking the stars. There is actually a shape. It was more like a boomerang than a, like a straight V. And then the lights were spaced pretty evenly. It was actually five lights that were a V, one in front two, and two on each side. And it was perfect, it was a perfect triangle. If you can imagine something the size of Camelback Mountain floating down Scottsdale Road, you have some idea of the intensity of this thing. The object we saw, if we opened up a newspaper, you could not block out the object that we saw. People say, Mike, now you saw a B-2 bomber. My response was, we could land all 40 of our B-2 bombers on the wing of that craft. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest things I've ever seen that, uh, that moved like that. I mean, it was just enormous. It happened last night, and eyewitnesses who saw it say it's like nothing they've ever seen before. I don't know if it was as big as an aircraft carrier. It might have been because I've never seen an aircraft carrier fly. <laughs> it barely missed that mountain. Really? Yeah, came floating over the mountain. So had you not looked up, you wouldn't have known it was No, there. my daughter, it was 8.30 at night, my daughter was coming over here, and she ran in and said, Mom, you have got to see this. So we all... There was such an uproar about what people described seeing that we also did a story about it back in 1997. The first report of a strange flying object came at about 8.20 that night from a former police officer in Paulden, Arizona. Over the next 40 minutes, people gave similar reports of an object along a 200-mile route south to Phoenix and Tucson. It was gunmetal black. It wasn't shiny. It wasn't invisible. It was more of a dull, bluish-black color. And we both just stayed there and looked at it for a couple minutes, and it was completely silent. When you look down the street on a hot day in Phoenix, uh -huh. above the streets, like it's really wavy, and you see everything kind of distorted, uh -huh. and that's what it looked like up inside the middle of the craft. It was just gliding, and then it stopped, and then it like the sides retracted a little, and then it was gone. It just went acceleration to deceleration. It was no noise the whole time, and not a sound. Explanations have been tossed about that there were flares, that there were planes flying in formation. But Mark and Robin, we checked with the FAA today, we checked with Sky Harbor, we checked with Luke Air Force Base, and there's been no official explanation of those strange bright lights last night. Well, I'm going to order a uh, full you know, investigation of this through DPS. We're going to make all the necessary inquiries, and we're going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to find out if it was a UFO. Kirkpatrick, remember those mysterious lights in the sky? Well, the governor says there are new leads in the case. Good evening, Arizona. Governor is holding a news conference on the lights in the sky over Phoenix in March. Let's listen in. And now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. And don't get him too close to me, please. It's, you know. <clears throat> Now this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. I think what really irritated me was the joke the governor pulled with the Martian. You know, I just didn't have time for that kind of stuff. He was just dismissing everything that these people had seen and said, just like, we're all Looney Tunes. And I know what I saw, and that's not what you're telling me what I saw. I didn't see flares. I didn't see A-10 war Warthog. So how about we work together and try to figure out what this thing is?
So when you hear someone says they saw a UFO, you, what, you think they're crazy? Yes, I think they're crazy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what puzzles me is why people laugh at the subject of UFOs, but when the laughter stops, everyone secretly wants to know, are they real? See that now? See that big one? See it going? Do you see it? Jeez. I don't know if I want to know if UFOs are real, because then that raises a lot of other issues. Who are they? Why are they here? Are they going to hurt me? Do they have chocolate? <laughs> when I told my father I wanted to make a documentary about UFOs, he said I was crazy. In fact, my whole family did. And 95% of the time, this stuff is crazy. But the remaining 5%, that is what keeps me going. This man in the saucer, can you describe him? Well, what year was this taken, you? Uh, I'm James Fox, and I've been curious about UFOs for a long time. If you look down at the very bottom, there's the little disc. Very curious. Look at that. Evidently, the Air Force is curious, too. In pursuit of this obligation... And in 1952, they admitted it. We have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports. There have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. All blacked out? I wonder what was under there. With the help of investigative reporter Leslie Kane, I decided to put together some of the best witnesses from around the world for this film. Almost 10 years after the termination of Project Blue Book. And the cases there. and photographs you are about to see represent some of the best evidence that UFOs are real. Of so unknown origin, what were they after? It was the beam of light that came down on our feet. Ms. James? Beams were going down into the WSA. Hey, we are all in the limo and, and we're on the... The operator in the tower yes. would verify that and several of us. So they were looking for fizzo material. I hear the same question over and over. If UFOs are real, then surely someone in the know would be talking. So what time are we actually uh, <laughs> going on the air? Or do the I think six o'clock, you guys. Uh, yes, we never Good evening. A historic occasion will take place in Washington on Monday. Former high-level government employees, military officials, and pilots from all over the world will come together. They'll discuss their own UFO sightings and encounters, and they'll do it at the National Press Club in the nation's capital. This group has gathered together to call on the United States government to take an active role in investigating cases involving unidentified flying objects. James Fox, will you be there Monday too? <clears throat> Absolutely, yes. To establish the fact that uh, the phenomenon is real and it's, and it's happening worldwide. Five, are we now saying that the United States is taking this seriously or is this just an event? I, I think the United States is taking it seriously and they, they need to. Uh, it's it's long overdue. And you're going to moderate it, right? I'm going to moderate it. Uh, I'm Fife Symington. In 1997, during my second term as governor of Arizona, I saw something that defied logic and challenged my reality. Before this event, I met with the governor at his home to find out why he ridiculed the sighting. We were in the middle of um, investigating it and just couldn't get any answers. Paralleling that activity um, was this um, almost hysterical environment that was building the history. The governor told me what was actually going on behind the scenes. And we called uh, Luke Air Force Base and we called the FAA and I called various touch base with people. I called my general at the at the National Guard. Nobody had an explanation. People just sort of said, well, we just don't know what it is. Phoenix Councilwoman Frances Barwood was one of the only elected representatives willing to push for an investigation. I would have thought that they would have wanted to do an investigation, but apparently they would rather ignore it. I don't know why. At Barwood's request, Senator John McCain looked into the matter personally. We asked the Air Force to look into it, and this was the first response that we've gotten. We're going to go back and, and ask them to look at it again. Senator McCain wrote letters to both the National Archives and the Air Force. Both claimed not to have jurisdiction over such matters. I was kind of surprised at, uh, 
at, at that response. Um, but there are people who said they saw things, and whenever that happens, it, they deserve the, at least an investigation, it seems to me. The Air Force explanation eventually provided to Senator McCain was military flares dropped from A-10 Warthogs between 9.30 and 10 p.m. Oh my God! Oh. I hit Bader, finally. According to some analysts, these lights captured on film were flares. Well, that is a totally different configuration than we've ever seen before. Yep. But this does not account for the large boomerang-shaped object seen by the governor and hundreds, possibly thousands of others, across the state beginning several hours earlier. I mean, it clearly had uh, a shape to it, um, and, a, and a big shape, and it, and it was a constant shape. And you, you can't control flares that way. There's just no way they were flares. Why can't they tell us? What's it going to hurt? I would like, <laughs> I would like for them to come out and say, that's top secret and we're not going to tell you what it was. The V formation... I was only able to find one video taken of the earlier sightings. Over a period of somewhere between... I was, however, given this video taken by an army colonel a few years earlier. It reminds me of what Arizona witnesses described seeing. There's no sound and it's not planes flying in formation. I don't hear anything, do you? No, I don't hear anything. What in the hell is that? Can you see the stars? Can you see through it? Right there. There's yeah, I see it now. And it's and it's it's that's not planes flying in formation behind it either. It's another it's another triangle. What would you say to the people about it? I'd say I saw an unidentified flying object of massive proportions float over the city of Phoenix and Scottsdale, and I don't have the damnedest clue what it was. I saw it. It was over my house. I saw it for five minutes. It wasn't something that was a flash that I only saw for a second. Could it have been? I know what I saw. And I get very upset, and I would, was wondering why they won't find out what it was. Governor Simington, I am Bill Burns from the History Channel. Just a quick question. When you were giving your press conference back in Phoenix, were there any external pressures on you to diffuse the situation in the way you did, or did anyone instruct you not to comment on the truth of what was happening in Phoenix? Well, the only external uh, pressure and it was significant was the fact that there was just this massive public reaction to uh, the, the lights over Phoenix. Uh, I mean, we have just being inundated uh, by the press and people coming into my office saying this thing is just uh, reaching heights of uh, hysteria and, and concern. Um, I'd never seen that before. I mean, I'd been in office for quite a while and uh, I'd never seen uh, kind of that reaction. Um, and so uh, three of us sort of sat down at the end and decided to, to try to lighten the mood a little bit. Well, I'd like now to set the record straight. I never meant to ridicule anyone. My office did make inquiries as to the origin of the craft, but to this day they remain unanswered. I still don't know what it was. As a pilot and a former Air Force officer, uh, I can definitively say that this craft did not resemble any man-made object that I'd ever seen. Well, I now know that I'm not alone in witnessing something extraordinary. That's the bottom line. There are many high-ranking military, aviation, and government officials, many of whom are here today, who share my concerns. Some of them uh, have truly exceptional stories to tell. Hundreds of people saw a majestic triangle craft with a span of approximately 120 feet. Powerful beaming spotlights moving very slowly without making any significant noise, but in several cases accelerating to very high speeds. Physical traces on the ground from the craft were confirmed by the local police. The official conclusion 
of Japan in 1979 was that about 15% of the cases remained unidentified after careful analysis by our experts. Fue entonces que me acerqué a 100 metros del objeto. Tenía unos 10 metros de diámetro, estaba como esmaltado con una cúpula de color crema sobre una base metálica ancha y circular. No tenía motores, ni escapes, ni ventanas, ni alas o antenas. Carecía de todos los implementos típicos de un avión y sin ningún sistema visible de propulsión. Lamentablemente, el tema relacionado con los ovnis se encuentra muy contaminado y con una importante cantidad de información falsa. Most UFO sightings turned out to be misidentifications of things such as aircraft, uh, satellites and meteors. But in around 5% of cases, no explanation could be found. Washington DC is no stranger to this story. Could these saucers be some kind of a secret weapon of ours? No. If they were, Air Material Command would be the first to know. How about a device from a foreign country? We know they're not. What is your opinion, Colonel? The U.S. Air Force's involvement with UFOs started back in World War II when pilots reported being followed by luminous orbs. They were nicknamed Foo Fighters. By 1947, flying saucer sightings were getting national coverage. They flew like erratically like a, like a saucer would if, it, if you skipped it across the water. According to this memo titled Opinion Concerning Flying Discs by General Nathan Twining, the phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. No, it just come up like that and then it tipped and just I mean it really went. It didn't have no smoke, no motor, just the wind. It went fast. I've never seen anything go so fast in my life as that thing went. Yeah. The sightings over Washington in July 1952 were just part of one of the biggest and most impressive UFO waves in all UFO history. This incident was witnessed by the public, military pilots, and air traffic control. Pilots went aloft. They saw a luminous glowing object out in front of them, right where the radar indicated it to be. So you had ground radar, airborne radar, and the pilots' visual sightings. Look Magazine reported that radar operators at Washington National Airport tracked UFOs at speeds up to 7,000 miles per hour. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucer. Major General Samford, who was the Director of Information of the Air Force, called a press conference which was characterized at the time as being the largest press conference since World War II. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. There have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. Did the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, talk to you or concern you about the un unknown and the unidentified flying object? Oh yes, we discussed it at every conference that we had with the military and they never had been, never were able to make me a concrete report on. Do you have anything on the subject, sir? No, I have not had anything on the subject. And they, they, there's always things like that going on, uh, flying saucers. There were senior Air Force generals convinced that we had interplanetary visitors, and they were setting the policy. And they were behind the Life magazine article of, I believe, April 1952, which was titled "Do We Have Interplanetary Visitors?" You read the story, the answer obviously was yes. With the cooperation of the United States Air Force, Life magazine conducted an exhaustive one-year study. Out of a number of conclusions, this one caught my eye. 
No power plant known or projected on Earth could account for the performance of these devices. Dick Fowler Hose is a journalist and a qualified pilot. He saw what he believed to be a flying saucer. It was a flight from uh, Winnipeg to Vancouver. Uh, jet aircraft uh, were fairly high, about 37,000 feet, coming up in the mountain just about sunset. This unexplained light was, or disc-shaped object was down in the darkness. So I just happened to have a uh, camera with me and we took a picture. In my opinion, I think they were worried that it would panic the public if they knew that someone had vehicles that had this kind of performance way back right after World War II, a period of time. So they started telling lies about it. Dr. J. Allen Hynek investigated UFOs for the United States Air Force for over 22 years. The most well-known of these investigations was Project Blue Book. Where media is not a In this 1979 interview, Dr. Hynek revealed why the Air Force changed its public position. They were strongly guided by the CIA because the CIA was not concerned so much with UFOs as they were with UFO reports. They were afraid, actually, that if another nation wanted to per perpetrate another Pearl Harbor, that if their agents uh, spawned a bunch of false flying saucer stories that might clog the military wires, as actually happened in 1952. So they uh, devised the so-called Robertson panel, which I was an associate member at the time, a very prestigious panel. I was one of the lower-ranking ones. They had Nobel Prize winners and whatnot on it. But at any rate, they handed down the dictum, which then became sort of the unwritten law of the Air Force, don't rock the boat, play it down, cool it, don't get the public excited. Well, what is your answer to the people who uh, are sure there are spaceships and they say that you and the Air Force are in cahoots? Well, first of all, this business about being in cahoots is just simply a downright falsehood. And I know, having been in Blue Book for nearly 20 years, that whenever an interesting case came up, the very last thing in the world they would do is to notify the media. And when the media themselves found out something, the Air Force did its best to play it down. It's called it a balloon, called it uh, a star, called it... Balloons, meteors, satellites, aircraft seen with the sun glinting off of them, and uh, birds. Our critics continually charge that the United States Air Force is withholding information from the general public on this subject. This is absolutely untrue. And there is nothing in the records which would indicate that we have been visited by any advanced civilization. There is nothing to hide. There is nothing to hide at all. Good evening. Reports of flying saucers are nothing new. And when it got to the top of the trees, it stopped. So it looked like a round death. Residents of the area saw it. The police saw it. Sergeant Newell Schneider of the Sheriff's Office remembered it well enough to draw it. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. The Air Force sent its chief scientific consultant on UFOs, Professor J. Allen Hynek, to check the Michigan sightings. A little bit of swamp light appears here. It goes out. Another one appears over here. That goes out. Then, and But the illusion, as you from a distance, is that the objects have moved back and forth. The citizens of Michigan didn't buy it and asked then-Congressman Gerald Ford to investigate. Mr. Ford, uh, what about flying saucers? You've had some in Michigan in the past uh, week. Do you really believe in flying saucers? You've called for a congressional investigation. Dave, uh, we've had several uh, incidents in Michigan in the last uh, week, uh, incidents that uh, many reliable, good citizens felt were uh, sufficient to justify some action by our government and not the kind of flippant answer that was given by the Air Force uh, where they passed it off as a, a swamp gas. Now, this is not an attack on the Air Force spokesman or the project spokesman. They are simply following orders to explain away all UFO sightings as quickly as possible when they become public and deny that UFOs really exist scientists were being misled even as the public was being misled and to this day most scientists have no inkling of the serious hardcore evidence because now it's all treated like a tabloid subject. 
Are you sorry now that you did tell people what you saw? Yes, I am. I am. I am sorry because uh, it, it, not that it, it, it's not the truth, but it's just the idea, the reaction of the people. They think you're a nut. To tell you the truth, that's just what they figure you are. And I'm not going to take it from where I don't want nobody down in here. I, I just leave me alone. And if, and if the thing lands right there, right there by that pump, I'd never say a word. Ten years ago, right. 1969, they closed Blue Book. And I thought for a while that maybe, well, maybe this was finally going to be over. But since that time, we've had about 25,000 more UFO reports. Many of the hundreds of people reporting the sightings believe they've all seen the same object. It's called the Hudson Valley UFO. Not quite. I'll, I'll be t I'm going to tell you something, honey. I don't know what the hell it is. It moved in a very straight line, very slowly. There was absolutely no noise. There was not a sound. And it moved smoothly? Very smoothly, almost like it was floating. It was silent, it was hovering. I mean, airplanes can't hover. Do you believe in UFOs? Personally, no, sir. How do you know that you're not being used? How do you know that you know the full story when you say this? My name is Gary Tuckman with CNN, and this question is for the governor and Mr. Callahan. This really is a government that doesn't mind scaring us. We still have orange <laughs> alerts and red alerts, and yeah. they scare us all the time. It, yeah. it keeps people in work. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering why you think and you just state that that's the reason and that's it. Is that really the motivation yeah. for a government that doesn't mind scaring us? If uh, these uh, phenomena are as technologically advanced as they appear to be, then uh, one could say that we're uh, completely vulnerable as a civilization. And uh, that's, to some people, that might be horrifying. Uh, and I'm just speculating on that, that feeling of vulnerability. And so a lot of people like to say, well, you know, we're not vulnerable. That's just not true. That didn't happen. And uh, they shut it out of their minds. Well, we could do a little round table introduction then, if, if you know, yeah. because, you know, a few of us have only just met and things like that. Yeah, we met, so, we met today already, extensively. After the program, last evening, they did the survey on the internet, and they asked people, do you believe in UFOs? What were the results? 75 or 80 percent? 83 percent. He said okay. yes. So you have a chance. No. Yeah. You yes. have a chance. <laughs> yeah. 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 An opening. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Nice of you to make it. <laughs> guys are all here. We were talking about oh, it. Oh, really? Someone yeah. said to be here for 6:30. I think 6:30 yeah. is the right time. We've uh, had a crate of wine. I got here, here yet, so I came back. No. And we the night all before all our big event at the National Press Club, we all met for dinner. Certainly one of the people that I spoke to was a meteorological officer. My dream was coming true. Here I was, surrounded by credible people who were about to share incredible stories. So these are reliable uh, witnesses. Yeah. There were generals, pilots, physicists, an FAA official, an Air Force colonel. I'd never been in a room full of so many people of this caliber comfortably talking about the existence of UFOs. We were enjoying our time together. It was remarkable how everyone had something extraordinary in common. There was a mutual understanding, and I got some answers to some big questions. Why did the French government do what they did by releasing the UFO files just recently? It took 15 years to convince to do something, despite the public position of the US government, somebody, whether it was on an official or a sort of back-channel basis, but somebody most definitely was uh, looking into the UFO phenomenon. If you're not capable to identify whatever flies around, uh, there is something wrong. Could you say something very quickly? One of the things I always remember you talking about was when you'd be at a cocktail party and the subject would come <laughs> up with UFOs and you sat with one on the ground for 45 minutes and you'd bite your tongue. What was that like? Uh, it was difficult. But you know, in some ways there was some kind of satisfaction involved there. And they're talking about stuff The what if? And I knew. Uh, my name is James Penniston, uh, United States Air Force, retired. 
In 1980, I was assigned to the largest tactical fighter wing in the Air Force at the time. I was, I was stationed at RAF Woodbridge, England. Shortly after midnight on the 26th of December, 1980, Staff Sergeant Steffens briefed me that some lights were seen in Rendlesham Forest, just outside the back gate. He informed me that whatever he seen didn't crash. He told me it landed. I then ordered Airman Kabanzak, A1C Burroughs, to respond with me off-site. That night, we were on um, Security One, which was in charge of mobile uh, security for the Woodbridge base, and we responded to Jim Burroughs' sighting of something out on the edge of the uh, flight line. Well, the controller on the radio broadcast over the air that go down and check out a possible UFO. There was a craft of some sort that was uh, uh, sitting uh, just inside the tree line. When we arrived to the suspected crash site, it quickly became apparent that we were not dealing with a plane crash, or for that matter, anything else we've ever responded to. Burroughs would say to Jim Penniston, do you see that? Do you see, do you see what's out there at, that, at the edge of the trees? It was just bright lights, you know, and, and it, it, the only way you can describe it is, it, I guess you'd call it an object. At that point in time, three of us had direct observation of the craft. I then asked Airman Kabansak to relay the radio transmissions back to our control center. Burroughs and I proceeded towards the craft. The only noise we heard out in the woods was the, the noise of the animals. Just as Burroughs and I entered the tree line, the shape of the craft was defined. The closer we got, the more the white light dissipated, but what appeared was a triangular craft. When we approached it, it was, oh, I, I say it measured uh, probably about nine feet uh, long, uh, maybe six feet high, a little higher than me, maybe six and a half feet. The lighting emanated from the fabric of the craft, and it would actually move around. I mean, it would move. You'd have different locations where maybe a little blue lighting was going into it, or maybe a little red. And then there must have been some type of lighting underneath of it because uh, it silhouetted the aircraft itself. I had went around and started doing a 360 walk around the area, taking recording my observations. I was looking underneath the craft like that. I had taken quite detailed notes on that. Type of aircraft still unknown. No apparent landing gear, no sound, but appears to be pulsating somehow. Yeah, it was pretty nerve-wracking. I mean, well, you, you're, there's something there right in front of you, you don't know what it is. I would go ahead and uh, feel the craft, which was warm. Uh, there was static electricity in the air. Uh, very warm to touch. Identifying markings are on left front side. As I came around to the one side of the uh, of the craft, uh, there was etching on the um, uh, face me just above the uh, center part of the craft itself. Of course, this is done all freehand as I was walking around the craft. But these symbols ran from left to right across. And then underneath the, those, that line of symbols was this, uh, which is triangular and some type of circle here, some type of circle here, and a larger circle here. And of course, all this was filled in with the, like, the etching part of it. I was curious about the symbols that Jim Pennison copied in his logbook. I had these symbols enlarged and then showed him to cryptologist and mathematician George Daglish. I wanted to know if he had any ideas as to what they might mean. The first symbol looks to me like a vessel with a steering oar um, afloat in some sort of medium. The second symbol looks like a glyph associated with a mathematical idea known as the Fibonacci series, which is found everywhere in nature. And this is what we have here. The root of a Fibonacci series, one, two, and three, taken as a whole, which is a rather clever glyph, all in one. Mr. Daglish stressed uh, that this was only speculation, but I found his interpretations quite interesting, especially since I've always heard that the only universal language would be mathematics. From that glyph. So this is the, the last glyph, and how did you decipher uh, this? They could represent an apse in an orbit, a perigee or an apogee. 
And if they are apses, uh, apogees and perigees, it means that the orbiter is doing a highly precessive orbit, like that. So if you were going to survey a planet, and this is an orbiter, I assume, which would be a very sensible arrangement if you were using the vehicle as a surveying vehicle, because you would get a maximum look at the planet. I don't think they were trying to send us a metaphysical message about the beauty of life or the, uh, the, what, the reason for the universe or anything like that, or their own existence. I think it's just more of a utilitarian marking so that they knew what craft they were dealing with. I knew that that craft could not have been made by man. And then they started moving back in between the trees with absolutely no sound, no air disturbance at all. Take off, unknown speed, and I write, impossible. I mean, it was threatening to me, but it wasn't the type that you were gonna shoot on it. And also the fact was that, what would happen if I would have shot at him? <laughs> well, what good would it have done? That night, over 80 Air Force personnel all trained observers assigned to the 81st Security Police Squadron witnessed the takeoff. The information acquired during that investigation was reported through my military channels. The team and witnesses were told to treat the investigation as top secret. Thank you. As the deputy base commander, Colonel Charles Holt was in charge of the investigation when he too became a witness. In late December 1980, I was called upon to investigate a very strange event. An event that was distracting our security police from their primary duties. I believe that he went out there to debunk the whole situation and I think he got in the middle of a situation he couldn't explain either. Two nights later at the family Christmas party, I was interrupted by the on-duty police commander. He told of strange events and said, it was back. Since my boss had to present awards, I was tasked to go out and investigate. I fully expected to find an explanation. During this entire event, I was fortunate to have with me my small pocket recorder. It's a little in here. What you're about to hear are excerpts from the original recording made that night. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. There's yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it, too. Weird. Well, now we've got an object about 10 degrees directly south, 10 degrees off the horizon. And the ones in the north are moving, one's moving away from us. They're moving out fast. Yeah, we're both heading north. Okay, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. One approached at a very high speed and sent down a strange beam right at our feet. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Another object sent down beams of light into the weapons storage area. The whole time we had difficulty communicating with the base, as all three radio frequencies that we were using kept breaking up. I have no idea what we saw that night, but I do know with great certainty it was under intelligent control. Five-star Admiral Lord Hill Norton had been pressuring Parliament to provide clear answers on this case. I wanted to know if he believed a UFO actually landed at a U.S. airbase in England. That is one explanation that it actually happened, as Colonel Holt reported. The other explanation is that it didn't. And in that case, one is bound to assume that Colonel Holt and all his men were hallucinating. The British Ministry of Defense's position is that nothing of any defense interest took place. This position was strongly criticized by the Admiral. That the Colonel of a, an American Air Force base in Suffolk and his merry men are hallucinating when there are nuclear armed aircraft on the base must be of defense interest. If indeed what he says took place did take place, and why on earth should he make it up, then surely the entry of a vehicle from 
outer space, certainly not man-made, to a defense base in this country also cannot fail to be of defense interest. Outside the Parliament building, I met with Nick Pope. He investigated UFOs officially for the British government. I reopened the case and conducted a sort of uh, cold case review of the in original investigation. And I, I was shocked to find a series of basic errors had been committed, exactly the same sorts of errors that often fatally undermine a, a police investigation. Nick Pope shared with me some startling evidence from the Ministry of Defence's files. This is one of the most important documents to have emerged from the MOD's case files. Um, it's from an assistant director in DI-52. This is their assessment of the radiation readings that Colonel Holt and his team took at the landing site. What we have here is a plaster cast of one of the three indentations, the object that Jim and the other two gentlemen approached. It's approximately eight to 10 inches across and about three inches deep at its maximum point. <clears throat> this is a cast number two. He made an impression of all three of the indentations and they were all identical. Now, here's the key bit. These uh, levels seem significantly higher than the average background. And in fact, and I double-checked this with some other government scientists, it's about eight times normal. Uh, so this is absolute proof positive from the MOD's own uh, documentation that something extraordinary happened. Back in America, I arranged a meeting between Colonel Holt and Sergeant Nevels, one of the men who was with him that night. Well, I don't believe it. Come on, sir. How are you doing today? It's been a long time. Long time. These men shared an extraordinary experience, yeah, one that puzzles good. them to this day. Still wobble a little bit, but I'll make it. I was glad to have brought them together after 28 years. If you if you've been there and done that, it's a whole lot different than those the skeptics that we sometimes run around with, and they can't believe us. And a lot of the other people that were involved, especially Penniston and Burroughs and all, have had all kinds of complications and career problems. I did too. Penniston retired as a tech sergeant and probably should have made chief. There's no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flash of red light ahead. There's yellow. Step by step. Colonel Holt and Sergeant Nevels went over what happened that night. Yes, it's right on Aspen. Yellow, it's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. What was going on right there? It was approaching us. Yep. No way of calculating how fast it was going. It was just gone. And the turns were 90 degree turns. They were just abrupt. And, right, and there's no way, no way, that anything we had in technology then and I don't believe the technology we have today would allow anything that we saw to make the turns the way they turned. We met with General Gordon Williams, the wing commander of the entire base. He would neither confirm nor deny the incident. He did, however, tell us how he felt about a leaked memo written by Deputy Base Commander Colonel Charles Holt. That uh, went under the door and I didn't see it. Now, did he have a motivation in doing that? Did he think that if he brought it into me, I would have stepped on it? Uh, I certainly would have looked at it very carefully because it had some things in there that I uh, don't think we were prepared to uh, defend. Once that cat was out of the bag, you know, I couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again, and uh, it lived its own life. I just find this very interesting that the U.S. Air Force or, or government generally says that they don't investigate UFOs since the termination of Blue Book, and yet you're, you're convinced that there was an investigation that took place. So who gave the orders to do that? It certainly didn't come from anybody that was normally on the base other than the, the OSI. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell my daughter. I had a top secret clearance. And when I was told to shut up, I shut up. そして、その事実が1ヶ月後共同通信により新聞隠しに発表された。What I'm about to tell you is about an event that never happened. For an event that never happened, FAA official John Callahan certainly has a lot of evidence. They brought the voice tapes. He kept audio recordings between the cockpit and the tower as the incident unfolded. 
He has 30 minutes of taped radar that confirms the UFO, a chart that documents all the objects in the 747's flight path, and the official FAA report. Event that never happened. According to Callahan, all of this was presented to the CIA in a private meeting. When the pilot first reported the UFO, he described it as a huge ball with lights running around it. He said it was about four times bigger than the 747 he was riding. And remember, the 747 has an elevator. And he's looking out the window and he sees something that's four times the size of his aircraft. What you're about to see and hear are excerpts from the actual radar and cockpit conversations as the incident unfolded. So one time he says it's over here at 12 o'clock and 8 miles, and when the uh, antenna goes by, we see a target there. Ten seconds later, it is now behind him, six, seven miles behind him. So it's going from, from eight miles out here to six or seven miles back here, really in only five or six seconds. When I went back to headquarters, I gave Admiral England a quick briefing and showed him the video. He set up a briefing with the President Reagan scientific staff he told me my function was to hand this operation off to those people. And those people ended up being the CIA, the President's group, a bunch of grunts uh, that came to the meeting. The CIA said to all the people there, this event never happened. We were never here. And you're all sworn to secrecy. We are confiscating all this data. And they did. They took everything that was in the room. In those days, when you printed out something from the computer... Fortunately, he kept copies of everything back in his office. That's the end of my speech. Who are you going to believe? Your lying eyes or the government? And, well, how do you feel about your husband coming, coming forward? Well, I think that that's John. Uh, John is comfortable in what he says and what he does, and that if he, what he sees, he will tell what he sees, and I don't think anybody is going to tell him that he can't. And I'm proud of him. I think he does a good job, and he's telling the world what he should know. One of our greatest success stories was getting General Jafari from Iran to D.C. It took three months of negotiations to get his visa. Jafari was one of two Iranian fighter pilots ordered to intercept a UFO hovering over Tehran, Iran in 1976. The pilot in the first jet lost instrumentation and communication when he got too close to the brilliant object, so he headed back. About 10 minutes later, they scrambled a second jet, which I was piloting. General Jafari scrambled his F-4 Phantom jet to get a closer look. He gave us this Iranian Air Force reenactment film featuring the original witnesses and planes. Even though Jafari's F-4 fighter jet was traveling at the speed of sound, it was nowhere near fast enough. Imagine, when I was looking here, at about 70 miles out, and he jumps all of a sudden 10 degrees to my right, 
in this angle 10 degrees this part which it was traveling becomes about 26.7 miles per moment I don't say per second maybe maybe less than a second Jafari was flying towards the UFO when a smaller object separated from it and headed right at him his only instinct was to shoot at it but that turned out to be a bad idea all the instruments were fluctuating with the garbles and the radio so <laughs> I, I was really frightened so uh, I decided to turn away and I said if it comes closer than about four miles I will jump out so having maneuvered away from the object Jafari's control panel returned to normal and he regained contact with the tower Despite the United States government's claim that they have not investigated UFOs since the closing of Project Blue Book in 1969, this Defense Intelligence Agency report made in 1976 indicates otherwise. It was obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. So you think the reason why they're not telling us is because they can't trust everyone? They can't trust, and the second one, maybe as I said, they don't want the people to be panic. And we don't take sides on 360. We like to present you with facts and information from different angles and let you make up your own minds about things. That's particularly true with mysteries. And for many Americans, there's no mystery greater than UFOs. James Fox helped organize today's UFO-related event in Washington. He joins me now along with astronomer, former Air Force pilot and skeptic, James McGahey. Thanks for being with us, both of you. Um, wh why should, what this panel is calling for is essentially is some sort of government investigation of it. Why shouldn't there be further investigation? Well, there have been investigations well, what, and it was, well, hang on a second. Let me, let me just state this qu clearly. One of the what, things what that are I, we gonna let, let, help you keep interrupting me, sir, please. One of the things I want to mention very quickly is that the official position from the Air Force is that they terminated Project Blue Book in 1969 and there have been no official investigations since then. However, we found evidence to suggest the contrary on a number of cases in Tehran. The general said the Americans were making discreet inquiries about the case that excuse me, there, as well as Bentwaters, England. The colonel said that the OSI came in and investigated that case. So you believe there, there is a government investigation going on, there you are, just want it more they're public? Making dis they're making discreet inquiries, uh, unofficially, yes. Well, UFOs are basically a modern space age mythology. It's a, it's a, a conspiracy wrapped in superstition and myth. Where does this superstition and myth come from? And how could it be so pervasive? Within a few months of the original saucer report, Practically everyone in America was conscious of flying saucers. Oh, oh, there's an alien who's trying to kill me. Oh! Now, did you see a UFO? Uh, I, I did, and uh, the rest of the account, well, I, I didn't, I, it was unidentified flying object, okay? It's like, and, and, and so, wait, we're just You've getting You've got to be kidding. And then I would say, where was it? What did it look like? What were you doing? How much had you had before you saw it? It was probably some sort, some other satellite or um, a fast-moving airplane that they saw. I wouldn't believe them. I mean, uh, I know there's been sightings, uh, random, uh, not well documented. Well, Jay Leno once asked, if these UFO, these extraterrestrials are so highly evolved, how come it is that they only address people named Bubba who are <laughs> hunting and fishing? gentlemen, good morning. My name is Wilfred de Brouwer. I'm a retired Major General of the Belgian Air Force and I was Chief Operations in the Air Staff at the time that an exceptional UFO wave took place over Belgium. The, the nature of the sighting was such that uh, people identify a large triangular platform with a very intensive uh, spotlights and uh, also hovering, being static at a certain moment, uh, being able to fly at very low speeds 
and then accelerating to very high speeds in seconds. In addition, uh, these uh, objects didn't make any noise. It was only a humming noise. Were there ever any, any inquiries from the uh, American government uh, to the Belgian Air Force regarding uh, yeah. unidentified flying objects? Yes, well, some informal inquiries. Uh, but nothing formal. I would have liked to see a formal request. Uh, but uh, some people uh, came to my office and asked about uh, this phenomenon and also what we thought about it. Uh, and asked to have a copy of a video uh, which was taken by one of the aircraft uh, which tried to intercept uh, one of these objects. And I, I said, yes, you can have a copy, providing there is a formal request. And we never received a formal request. Hello, 544, Roger, I do have a um, primary contact now. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Ray Bowyer, and I fly a civilian airliner as captain. I've been invited here due to my sighting last April of multiple as, as yet unidentified objects over the Channel Islands region of the English Channel. Thanks for joining us. Pilots and aircraft passengers have confirmed sightings of a large unidentified flying object off the coast of Guernsey. The mysterious shapes were spotted earlier in the week uh, and are described as a long motionless object that measured up to a mile wide. Five four four, then last message. Traffic, uh, not really say how far, but a mile twelve o'clock uh, level. Roger, I've got a very bright object. Uh, uh, well, say, not say how far. Extremely bright, yellow, orange object straight ahead. Uh, very flat platform. We're looking at it through binoculars as we speak. Hello, five four four. Roger, I do have a um, primary contact now. Uh, very faint primary contact, just to the left, probably your 11 o'clock this time, in a range of uh, about four trap miles. Roger. I've got a definite contact, my 12 o'clock, very bright yellow object, looking, well, like a cigar. Uh, Jersey Blood at 832, the zone asked us to look if we could see an object which is um, being seen by A-Line at the moment. We've got something about 8 o'clock resembling the description. Roger, and 832. Roger, what range would you estimate that target? Around about a similar range to Albany for myself. Well, looking through binoculars I am now, uh, there's a second one just appeared behind the first one from where I am. Roger, 544, just confirming that all the passengers can see this aircraft. Uh, I've got the island visual, it's dead ahead. Can't say how far, probably five miles, but it's staying the same size. Uh, looks to be off the north. North northwest coast of Albany. A line five four four. Roger, would you like to send? Please, I better have to go down. I think. Uh, five four four. Roger, descend to altitude two thousand feet. The QNH is one zero two one. Ten two thousand feet one zero two one. It's very plain to see from where I am now, without uh, any binoculars. Were you scared? I wasn't too happy. Put it that way. It's quite glad to get on the ground and have a cup of tea. We flew to Guernsey, an island off the northwest coast of France, to get some first-hand testimony where the sighting took place. Here, we met with Captain Ray Bowyer and two of his passengers. We're traveling back from Southampton to, to Alderney in, in the Trilander. Uh, I had noticed uh, Ray uh, looking out through the windscreen with his binoculars, which is quite unusual. I saw Ray turn around and talk to someone behind him while we were flying. Now, it wasn't worrying from the standpoint of flying, but it was unusual. And he was gesturing to something down below. On nearing the object, a second identical shape appeared beyond the first. Both objects were of a flattened disc shape with a dark area to the right. They were brilliant yellow with light emanating from within. And I estimated them to be up to possibly a mile across. 
I pointed it out to John. He had to lean across me to be able to see it. It, 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 was, it was like that. This was a big object in the sky, very, very big object. Um, and I didn't want to be too close to it. So it was at that time anyway where we had to descend to land. And uh, with both objects still visible and to a lot of the passengers in the back of the aircraft, we descended through the 2,000 foot haze layer and uh, lost sight of it. So Ray, why didn't you bring this to the attention of your passengers? I mean, normally when a pilot sees something of, of interest, he says, if you look out to your left, you'll see... Yeah, New York. <laughs> it was a little bit away, far away from you. Well, it was, um, I didn't want to alarm anybody at that point. Uh, there again, as we got closer to these objects, there was no hiding it. They were just there. I've taken note of some of the differences between the uh, British and the US reporting system. It appears that attitudes on opposite sides of the Atlantic are very different when it comes to the required reporting and recording of this type of event. I would have been shocked if I was told that the CAA in UK would obstruct an investigation or if the CAA told me that what I had seen was something entirely different. But it seems that pilots in America are used to this sort of thing here. I returned home from Guernsey to find a DVD sent to me from Salida, Colorado. Listen carefully to the six-year-old girl who points out a UFO to her dad. Dad, that a spaceship grow bigger like that. Huh? Huh? Uh-huh. It could. I'm not sure what the sounds are, but the object reminds me of what Ray and his passengers described seeing. It moved over that part of the sky there. It probably moved 500, it probably moved 100 miles in a matter of a second or two. See that now? See huh? that big one? See it going? Do you see it? Oh, you can't see I, it. I can't see it with this. Jesus. My name is Jean-Charles Duboc. I am a retired Air France captain. During Air France flight 35-32 from Nice to London on 28 January 1994, I observed with my crew a UFO in broad daylight near Paris. And it looked like this, with a bank angle of 45 degrees. It seemed to be a huge flying disc. It stabilized and stopped moving. But it was about 1,000 feet wide. The most incredible aspect is that it became transparent and disappeared in about 10 to 20 seconds. My co-pilot, Jeff Stewart and I, quickly realized that what we were seeing did not resemble anything known to us, and we reported our sighting to Rance Traffic Control. There is a crew of three persons plus radar uh, correlation at the same time, not the same place, but the same time, and that means that we have had something real over Paris one day, a huge thing. Good evening. Last week, several people in Stephenville, Texas, a small rural town of about 15,070 miles southwest of Fort Worth, witnessed what many are calling a UFO. James Fox, I know you've been probing this for a long time. We've never got an answer to this. Why do you think the Air Force doesn't want this out? Well, I mean, what are they going to say? Uh, we don't know what's flying around uh, in our airspace with yeah, impunity. Why can't, why can't they say that? I think that possibly could. I wish they would. Uh, if the Air Force is listening tonight, why don't you tell us the truth? I came in on Tuesday night, a week and a half ago, started down the driveway, and I looked back here to the southwest, 
just past the windmill, so I'd say maybe five miles away, there was a, a real bright light came on. It was almost as bright as like a, a welding arc. One of the guys that was at my house that night called up and said that he wasn't coming back to my house until we got armed guards. And I said, why is that? He said, well, there was a UFO flew over your house Tuesday night. I said, I saw it. I was so distracted by what I saw that you could have had you could have had a train go in front of me and I would have probably heard it because I was so focused on these lights, but I do not remember hearing any noise at all whatsoever. How, how would you describe the acceleration? Uh, probably the, the speed of, of light. And uh, I tried keeping up with my binoculars and I couldn't. This case, so far, well, we, we qualifies for that 5%. That the lack of sound, I don't know, the speed of the object, and apparently I the military's interest. There were two jets coming from that direction, this way, and I did hear the jets. You know, we're used to seeing military aircraft in our skies here in this area. We're used to seeing, you know, the helicopters and the fighter jets and the C-130s. And I mean, we know what those look like. And by the way, so, when it comes to military aircraft, I am a trained observer, so. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that's supposed to mean. Whatever that means, right? <laughs> Why don't we t uh, take another break here? Uh, we're visiting with uh, James Fox, filmmaker in, in town, uh, doing research on the, uh, the UFOs and interviews. Uh, we'll take a break. We're back right after this. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Dublin. In Dublin, the whole town showed up to discuss this sighting. My name is Steve Hudgens. I'm senior field investigator for MUFON. We're down here to investigate this extraordinary event. It was going so fast and it didn't make any noise that the light seemed to be streaming and breaking around it. Then 10 minutes later it came back by and that's when it had the two military jets chasing it. I've been a witness to this and give you all the information I can. You don't want to come forward and say anything because they'll say, oh, they're an idiot, because I've thought that before until I saw this. I guarantee you the jet, whoever's flying the jets, they had a visual on it. It was incredible. I listened to many witnesses and then went to the editors of the local paper where this story first broke. Headlines, I mean, these are all headlines. Angela Joyner, saw me on CNN the night before and assumed I had all the answers. Major Carl Lewis at uh, Carswell, I've talked to him a lot and uh, he said something of this size would leave a sonic footprint much like what we know as a tornado path. It would just demolish things on the ground. Why, why don't we see that? I have no idea. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Angela and local radio station Mandatory FM introduced me to Ricky Sorrells. We had a drink at the local bar where he agreed to meet with me the following day. All these aircraft in the area, they wouldn't normally be flying. They told me that Ricky had seen a lot more than lights in the sky. Hey, we called that door kid up. I used to think the people that saw this and came on camera and said this kind of stuff. I thought, man, these guys need some help, you know? But it happened to me, and I can't change that. I had a hard time dealing with it, but... Uh, she looked out all the way in that direction, you didn't see the edge. Looking up, Ricky said he could not see the edge of the craft in any direction. You couldn't see the edge of it? Couldn't see the edge of it. But I do know this, it's bigger. You could have landed an airplane on that, I believe. God, it's incredible story. Nothing, no sound, no when it was hovering. Nothing when it moved from left to right, and nothing when it took off. And, uh, Holding his rifle, and yeah, sometimes actually looking through his scope, Ricky you know, stood uh, under the craft for about that. three minutes. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation, but... No, I certainly I, haven't. <laughs> I've been in it only very few times in my life, but I had to slow my mind down to, to actually think about what to do with it, the information that I was receiving for the first time. And uh, that's what I did. I studied it. You know, I've seen no nuts, bolts, rivets, seams, no welds, uh, none of this. It, it looked like a piece of sheet metal. Um, you know, it, it wasn't shiny. It was a dull, uh, I don't know what you call it, matte finish maybe. Um, and this is what I had a hard time with, was if something was to leave, in my mind, it should pivot up and go like an airplane would. This did not do that. This stayed completely flat, and 
it went at a 45 degree angle away. And it took off at such a high rate of speed that no way I can describe it is if I would have blinked, I would have thought it just disappeared. On January 21st, 2008, Robert Powell and Glenn Schultz received radar data from the FAA. This image was created directly from that data. Each black dot, and there were over 140, represent radar confirmation of an unknown object whose flight path is seen heading towards Crawford Ranch. I just want to know what it is. You know, why, why was it here? What was it? Uh, is it ours? You know, that kind of thing. Although the military initially denied being in the area, the official explanation from the Air Force is now a flight of F-16s. After each witness I meet, I find it increasingly difficult to accept the military's response. I've actually stepped back and tried to view the big picture. Uh, I would like to find out what it is. And if people believe me, okay. If they don't, that's okay too. T-minus 15 seconds and counting. Nine, Mercury eight, astronaut Gordon seven, Cooper six, was the last American five, astronaut four, to go up in space alone. Two, he orbited the planet 22 two, times. While stationed at Edwards Air Force Base in the early 1950s, Cooper was part of an event that has never been explained. I was having some cameramen film the installation of a precision landing facility we were putting in right on the edge of the dry lake. And this saucer flew right over him and put down three little gear and landed out on the dry lake bed. And they went out picked up their cameras and moved on out toward him filming. And he lifted off, put the gear back in the well, and climbed out at a very high rate of speed and disappeared. By the time they got back with the developed film, I was on the higher and higher and higher level officer talking to me, finally with the colonel telling me to, uh, you know, when the film arrived at my desk to put it in the carrier pouch, there would be a courier there at my office by that time already, and, and they'd arrange for him to fly in our base airplane back to Washington with these films, and uh, do not run prints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Did you watch the film? We didn't have a chance to run it. I had a chance to hold it up to the window and look at it. It was certainly a good film. Did you ever keep in touch with anybody about it or discuss it? How would I keep in touch with anybody about it? There's no way within the military or within the government of keeping track of something that is classified, unless you're directly involved in it, and I was not. This meeting was a turning point for my father. Yeah. Gordon Cooper was an icon of his generation, and my father was amazed by his story. At that point in time, there was no doubt in my mind that this vehicle was uh, made at some other place than here on Earth. And it was, that must have been extraordinary. Yeah, well, Buck Rogers and Flash Garden coming true. <laughs> After the film was sent to Washington, it was never seen or heard of again. Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell was the sixth man to walk on the moon. He has met with people in military and government positions from several countries who have privately shared with him information about UFOs. Seem to be well documented events uh, that represent flying craft that do not match anything we have in an earthbound arsenal. I felt that Dr. Mitchell would know the reasons for secrecy. Why are we stonewalled? I can't answer that question. I, I think it's long past time to open this up to the public. Uh, but the best answer is probably because <clears throat> they don't know what to do about it anyhow. My father and I caught up with President Carter at a book signing in San Francisco. What happened to the UFO issue? What happened to the UFO issue? I don't really know what happened to it. I saw one, but I don't know what, it just disappeared. Okay. Did you ask when you were president? What you yes, but uh, there's a lot of different answers and nobody knows, has proof of things. Okay.
The question of secrecy has puzzled me for years. I asked the panelists in DC to offer possible explanations. Some of the questions that man on street have, and, and whoever wants to address this can, is why, in your opinion, would any government hide this uh, from the people or not disclose this type of information of what's going on? When there are uh, w witnesses or sightings uh, coming in, they are very reluctant to, to, to uh, pick up the issue, to investigate, because they have no structure and they don't know how to handle it. Si existe una amenaza de origen desconocido, que no tiene explicación, eso podría amenazar este sistema de conservación de poder. I suspect there are at least five agencies in U.S. government that have investigative capability and do maintain files on UFOs. The public opinion, I think, is asking for information and is ready to believe that there is something serious. If we can convince the government, it could change. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jean-Claude Rib, and I am an astronomer working for the French Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique from 1963 to 1998. I contributed to the French Cometa Report, a three-year military study on UFOs and national security, released in 1999. Cometa translates as Committee for In-Depth Studies. It was, in essence, a high-level think tank. Cometa included such members as four-star general Bernard Norlin, who was the former commander of the French Tactical Air Force and military counselor to the Prime Minister, as well as André Lebeau, former president of the National Center for Space Studies, and attorney at law Michel Algan, director of the Cometa Group. The Cometa Group published its findings in an historical 90-page report titled UFOs in Defense, What Should We Prepare For? The formation of the Cometa Group was initiated by French Air Force General Dennis Letty. Cometa concluded that about 5% of the cases studied were inexplicable and that the best explanation was what the authors called the extraterrestrial hypothesis. With investigative journalist Leslie Kane, I flew to France to meet General Letty. We met the general at his home on the outskirts of Paris. We went over some of the more puzzling encounters that led the group to their conclusions. And he saw the disc uh, over him. Pilot sightings confirmed by radar. Going, uh, very quickly out of his sight. And cases involving soil and plant analysis from landing sites. I had looked into one of these cases myself. Farmer Renato Nicolai from Trans en Provence reported that a disc-shaped object landed in his garden in the late afternoon. When he told his wife, she assumed he had heat stroke and had hallucinated. However, scientific analysis of the landing site showed high levels of radiation, and when I visited the site back in 1999, almost 20 years later, nothing had grown in that spot. The town of Trans en Provence labeled the farmer a flying saucer fanatic. General Letty also shared with us some impressive photographic cases. One of these was featured on the cover of the Cometa report. So it's mapping, is it mapping, mapping the ground? Mapping, mapping the ground. And developing. A mapping plane from the government of Costa Rica was flying at 10,000 feet. It had a high resolution camera running automatically under the fuselage, taking a picture every 17 seconds. On one of the frames, this object was captured. After careful analysis by several scientists, including Richard Haynes and Jacques Vallée, it was determined that the object captured on film was a real three-dimensional airborne object. So do you think if it was announced that people would panic? If the government's announced, well, there are, the unidentified objects are real? Uh, 
I cannot say yes, but I cannot say no. <laughs> I asked the general to explain the Cometa Report's extraterrestrial hypothesis. For us, we think that the best explanation is that object came from outside. Uh, we don't say they come from outside, but the best explanation is this is that uh, hypothesis. In 2007, an investigative branch of CNES, the French equivalent of NASA, made 1,600 sightings spanning five decades available to the public. I asked CNES for an interview. I wanted to know who allowed the release of these files and why. C'est le président du Centre national d'études spatiales euh, quand, on, quand il a décidé de remettre en route l'activité du GEPAN, de réorganiser, qui a donné comme mission de travailler euh, de façon transparente vis-à-vis -vis du public et des médias. We reviewed several extraordinary cases. Some even involved landings. I asked him what his personal beliefs were. Je crois que euh, probablement nous découvrirons dans le futur que peut-être il y a de tout et que certains cas sont peut-être des visites extraterrestres, mais d'autres cas seront probablement des, des observations naturelles qu'on n'arrive pas encore à expliquer aujourd'hui. Et ça, c'est grande comme histoire. C'est grande histoire. Ouais. C'est un grand, grand projet. Ouais. <rire> Big job. <rire> Good job. <rire> I wanted to know how releasing this information might have affected the people of France. We took to the streets. Je vous en ai mis, vous croyez tout de suite qu'il est, il est fou Non, je non, je pense que je pense qu'il doit y avoir des euh, des, des... Des, des, des hallucinations ou certaines choses qui permettent de penser qu'on a vu un ovni alors qu'il n'y en avait pas. Does it make you scared? Yeah. I'm scared too that they're going to come and they're going to be hostile and they're going to try and, and they're going to hurt us or do something to the world. Do you think governments know more than what they're telling us? Apart from American governments. Yeah. Est-ce qu'il est possible que ça peut venir ici? Pourquoi pas? So what do you do? You, do you think that the British government, the MOD, is preparing for any type of disclosure? Or do you think it's just going to? How's it going to happen? Or well, is it going to happen? It's not going to be, as I say, disclosure with a big D. Right. It's going to be disclosure with a small D. In other words, we will be releasing the files. But the in May 2008, uh, the British government began the process of releasing its entire archive of UFO files. From 1991 through to 1994, I was the desk officer responsible for these investigations. And these cases included incidents where reliable witnesses, such as police officers and pilots, reported structured craft performing speeds and maneuvers significantly in excess of anything that they'd seen military jet aircraft perform. In July of 2009, the Ministry of Defense released this document. It's a briefing regarding the mass sighting over England in 1993. In summary, it states, there would seem to be some evidence on this occasion that an unidentified object or objects of unknown origin was operating over the UK. To the skeptics who say there's no evidence, I would say this. 
Uh, the Ministry of Defence in the United Kingdom has received 10,000 UFO reports since 1950. Uh, not just lights in the sky, but structured craft, sometimes tracked on radar. But don't take my word for it. All this can be viewed at the National Archives on the Ministry of Defence website. So the evidence is uh, right out there. The phenomenon has not changed a great deal. It has not changed materially since 1947. And I'm quite sure that neither we nor the Russians had anything like the capabilities demonstrated by the UFOs in 47. I don't think we have now. Thousands of witnesses now, credible uh, witnesses, which can confirm that indeed they saw uh, activities which cannot uh, be related to uh, terrestrial activities. They're not aerodynamic. There's something else. And the suspicion is that they're anti-gravity or some kind of electromagnetic, gravitic drive to them, which would explain a lot of things that goes on, including the electromagnetic effects on vehicles and so forth. Furthermore, it is not customary for countries to test their secret weapons or secret devices in 133 different countries all over the place. And also, from a moral standpoint, I doubt very much that we would have sent astronauts to the moon using antiquated chemical fuels if we had a way of doing it much more efficiently. If we have, then it's criminal that's being kept strictly in military hands, because this would solve all of our energy problems in the world. So I, I've given up the whole idea that it could possibly be from uh, any place on Earth. Why don't governments tell the public what's going on? To accept that some object overfly and the country be unable to clear the sky of the... You cannot admit that. Do you think it's possible that it was from another world? I... My Air Force training says I can't think that way, okay? A story this big, there's no way it could be kept secret from the public. What do you say to someone like that that says that? Well, somebody's kept it pretty secret for quite a while, haven't they? Our country needs to reopen its official investigation that it shut down in 1969. The United States government can no longer shun an international dialogue about this phenomenon. And we invite the government to work in cooperation with countries as represented on both sides of me here today. This position is supported by President Clinton's former Chief of Staff, John Podesta. Podesta, also an advisor to President Obama, spoke at a 2002 press conference organized by the Coalition for Freedom of Information. Uh, I think it's time to open the books uh, on, on uh, questions that have remained in the dark, on the, on the question of, of government investigations of, of UFOs. It's time to find out what, what the truth really is that's out there. Uh, we ought to do it really because it's right. We ought to do it because the American people, quite frankly, can handle the truth. And we ought to do it because it's the law. Bring up these witnesses from the Air Force and the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. Have them interrogated by members of the House or Senate committee. Let them put their records on the line. And let the people who have allegedly seen unidentified flying objects come and testify. There was one last thing I asked Jack Patnay, the man who helped release France's UFO files what advice he would give to the American government. Oh, j'ai pas de j'ai pas vraiment de conseils à donner au gouvernement américain, je pense qu'il est <laughs> mais bon, je pense que simplement dire que que je pense pas qu'il faut avoir peur de la diffusion de ces informations. Voilà, c'est tout. Mais je veux pas me permettre de donner de conseils au gouvernement américain, certainement pas. Un avion procédé à perseguirlo et nous sommes ido alejándonos y en ascenso de la base. I've met with UFO witnesses from around the world, military officers, politicians, and everyday people like you and me. And he says, this target over here... They come forward with nothing to gain and everything to lose because they want 
answers. Way across this valley. Not the same old explanations of swamp gas, military flares, weather balloons, or misidentified aircraft, but the truth. There's no reason for me uh, not to say what I saw. I had nothing to hide, I have nothing to gain. Maybe somebody involved with the U.S. government knows the origin of these craft, but I don't. All of a sudden, 10 degrees to my right. If they're ours, then somebody has been hiding revolutionary technology for over 50 years. I've never seen anything go so fast in my life as that thing went. Yeah. If any of them are not man-made, then we're not alone.